The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, so I should probably get started. Um, so I just wanted to mention this Friday, the libraries are having Furry Friday. So you know they have therapy dogs come, and if you like dogs, it's kind of fun to go get cuddled by the dog. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, you know, last term there was a student taking 3032 who was interested in art, and I kept trying to find art pictures for him, and he's not here. But I thought everybody else kind of liked the art too. So I belong to the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Mass, and they have an exhibit right now on wood and on sort of using wood as a sculptural material. And this is kind of one of their posters to advertise it. Uh, so this thing was carved out of a single piece of wood, I think. Um, and they've got lots of other sort of sculptural wood. So I thought you might like to see that. Um, if you wanted to go to Salem, there's a couple of options if you don't have a car. You can take the commuter rail to Salem. You can also take the ferry. And if you take the ferry to Salem, you can, it's like a five minute walk to where the ferry lets you off to get to the Peabody Essex. And it's a kind of neat museum. It's not too big, it's kind of small. Um, but it's a beautiful building and they have neat stuff there. So you could go to the Peabody Essex Museum. Hmm? Yeah, you've been there? Yeah, that's really nice, yeah. Okay, so I was gonna talk about honeycomb-like materials in nature today. And I'm gonna talk about wood today. And I, I, I might finish this today, I might not. And then I was gonna talk about cork for a little bit um, on Wednesday, and then we'll start talking about foams after that. Um, so I have a couple of sort of cute little language historically things, and you know how I like that stuff too. So <clears throat> I have two things about, um, about words that are related to wood. So the word materials, do you know where the word materials comes from? It's, uh, it comes from the Latin. So there's the Latin materius materia, and materius materia means wood or the trunk of a tree. So when you, you know, if you think of studying materials, you know, in olden times, that was like studying wood. And another cute thing that I found was that in Old Irish, the names of the first few letters of the alphabet are named after trees. So the letter A, that's called alum in Old Irish, and alum is the word for elm. And B is, I don't know if I'm saying these right, it's called beth, and that's the word for birch. And C is call, that's the word for hazel. And D is dare, and that's the word for oak. And so they sort of named the letters of the alphabet after, after different kinds of trees, different kinds of woods. So I just thought those were kind of interesting historical things. Okay, so I wanted to start by talking about wood structure. And then we're gonna look at how wood deforms and fails and talk about um, the data that people have measured for the wood properties, things like stiffness and strength. And then we'll talk a little bit about how the honeycomb models can be applied to understanding the mechanical properties of woods. So this is kind of a generic trunk of the tree here. And we're defining three axes. The radial axis comes radially out of the tree. There's the tangential axis, so that's the x1 and the x2 axes. And then there's the longitudinal or the axial axis, x3. So if you think of the wood as being in a very, very simple way, just like the honeycomb, uh, the radial would be this way on, the tangential would be that way on, and the axial would be that way on, okay? So it's, it's like that. And if you neglect the, the growth rings, you can say that the wood's orthotropic, and that's typically what people do. They neglect the growth rings, and they say that it's orthotropic. And the density of the woods, the relative density, ranges from about 5% for balsa wood to about 80% for lignum vitae. So I brought in some pieces of wood. So this is balsa wood. You're probably familiar, you know, making different kinds of models with balsa. So balsa is very light, grows in Ecuador, and um, it's the lightest wood. And this is lignum vitae. You're probably not so familiar with that. This actually grows in Florida, and it's the densest wood. It has a relative density of 0.8, and it's so dense that if you put it in water, it sinks. So it's, it's a very dense wood. Um, and the way the wood cells grow is that if you, if you look at the sort of structure here of the tree, there's the bark on the outside here, and then there's the kind of wood cells inside the bark. And there's a layer of cells in between the bark and the wood called the cambial layer. And that's really the layer of cells that are alive and are dividing. So if you think of the, the wood cells, there's, uh, they're living when they're in that little cambial layer there, and they're dividing. And that cambial layer, the cells 
have a, a plasma membrane and a protoplast, and then they, they sort of exude the plant cell wall. So a little like bone cells, like if you think of bone in your body, there's osteoblasts and osteoclasts, different kinds of bone cells. But the bone cells uh, secrete the sort of collagen and the calcium phosphate that are the sort of hard mineral part of the bone that you think about as a bone. And that's not a living thing. The cells are the living thing. That, that's like an extracellular matrix. And the trees, it's a little bit the same. So there's the, the living cells that are just under the bark, and they have this plasma membrane and the protoplasm. And over a few weeks, they excrete the plant cell wall, and then they die. So the living cells die, and you're left with the plant cell walls. And then as the plant, you know, as the tree grows, uh, these, you're always having a layer of these cambial cells, and it forms bark on the outside and wood on the inside. So there's sort of a layer of cells that are differentiated such that on the outer layer they form the bark and on the inner layer they form the wood. And as the wood, you know, as the tree grows, the cambial layer is kind of expanding out radially. So let me, let me write some of these things down. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So let me just write down those two little word things just because I think they're cute. So the word materials is from the Latin Materius, materia, and that means wood or the trunk of a tree. And here's the little old Irish thing. It's not like I think, you know, I'm not going to put this on the test or something. I just thought it was cute. Um, So the letter A is alum, which is elm. And the letter B is beef, which is birch. The letter C was call, which is hazel. And D was dare. And that's oak. Okay, that's just, just for general interest. So then the wood structure, we can think of it as orthotropic if we ignore the um, growth rings. And if you have a, a sort of large diameter tree and you take a piece of wood, um, you know, not from the very center, but from somewhere sort of near the outside, then that's not a bad approximation. Then the relative density of the woods ranges from about 0.05 for balsa to about 0.8 for lignum vitae. Any Latin scholars here? Anybody, did, I took one year of Latin in high school. Anybody took Latin? No, no Latin. So I think this means lignum vitae, I think, is tree of life. Vitae is the sort of uh, life. And when it has this ending AE, it means of life. So I think that's the tree of life is lignum vitae. So trees have a cambial layer beneath the bark. And the cell division occurs in that cambial layer. So the new cells on the outer part turn into bark, and the new cells on the inner part turn into wood. have the living plant cells. That have the plasma membrane and the protoplast. Okay. 
and those cells then secrete the plant cell wall, which sort of surrounds them. So in trees, the living cells lay down the plant cell wall over a f period of a few weeks, and then the, the living cells die. Oops. Back here. you always retain a layer of those cambial cells. So you may have heard if you have a tree and you, you, know, you cut a ring around the tree and through the bark, if you go into those cambial cells and you destroy them, you kill the tree because you're killing that layer of living cells. Then we want to look at the, the cellular structure of the woods as well. And I've got a, a couple of slides here. This one is of softwoods. And softwoods have two types of cells. They have tracheids, which are the bulk of these cells here. And the tracheids provide structural support. And the tracheids also have little holes along the length of them at, the, at their ends called pits. And those pits allow fluid transport um, up and down the tree. And then the softwood also has these ray cells here. So those are examples of ray cells. So this is a transverse section. This is a longitudinal section here. Um, and the rays are parenchyma cells which store sugars. So softwoods have tracheids and rays. And then hardwoods, here's an example of a hardwood oak. Uh, they have three types of cells. There's cells called fibers. So these guys all in here would be fibers. They provide the structural support. They have vessels, these really large cells that provide fluid transport up and down the tree. And they also have rays. Uh, so here's some rays here. And again, those rays are parenchyma cells that store sugars in the tree. So let me just write down what all these cells are. So in, so in softwoods, the, most of the cells are these tracheids. So they make up the bulk of the tree. Uh, something like 90% of the tree, and they provide structural support. And they have holes in the cell wall for fluid transport, and those are called pits. And to give you some idea of what size they are, they're a few millimeters long, so something like two and a half to seven millimeters long. And then they're tens of microns in the other two directions. So there's something like 20 to 80 microns across. And the cell wall thickness, T, is usually a few microns. So something between about two and seven microns. So typically, the denser the wood, the thicker the cell wall is going to be. Oops, let's see if I can put the rays down here, put it on the same board. So the rays are parenchyma cells that store sugar.
And then the hardwoods have three types of cells. They have the fibers that provide the structural support. And the amount of cells that are fibers varies depending on the species, but it's usually somewhere around 35 to 70 percent of the cells. And then they have the vessels, which are the sap channels. That provides for the conduction of fluids. And that's between about 6 and 55 percent of the cells. And then again, there's rays that store sugars. And they usually make up about 10 to 30 percent of the cells. So there's the structure of the sort of cellular structure that this kind of length scale of sort of tens of microns. And then there's also a structure within the cell wall itself. And the cell wall itself um, is made up of cellulose fibrils in a matrix of lignin and something called hemicellulose. So if you look at the cellulose structure, the cellulose has um, a regular structure, a sort of periodic lattice, uh, and it's crystalline for most of the length of the fibrils. So this is the, the structure of the, the cellulose here, and uh, this is showing at a slightly larger length scale. It might have a crystalline region here and then a non-crystalline region here, and these macrofibrils, which are made up of bundles of microfibrils, are about uh, 10 to 25 nanometers, and each one of the microfibrils might be 3 to 4 nanometers across. So you have these cellulose fibers, and then the cell wall is made up of different layers. So there's uh, what's called the primary wall here, which has a random arrangement of the cellulose fibrils. Then there's an outer layer here. These are all called secondary layers. This is S, uh, let's see. I think that's S1. Uh, yeah, that's S1. Uh, and it has a, this arrangement of the uh, fibrils. Then there's a, a layer called S2, and it's generally the thickest layer in the cell wall. And the cellulose fibrils are aligned not perfectly vertical, but a little off the vertical. And the angle between the vertical and the orientation of the cellulose fibers is called the microfibrillar angle. And then there's a third layer here, S3, with again a different winding of the fibers. So because the S2 layer is the thickest layer, and because the fibrils are closest to the vertical axis, the S2 layer actually contributes the most to the um, longitudinal mo uh, modulus and stiffness of the, and strength of the cell wall. So that's kind of the layer of, of the cell, uh, arrangement of the cell wall. And then, so that one cell would have that, another cell would have that, and in between the two, there's a layer called the middle lamella that kind of glues them together. So that's the arrangement of the cells. Um, so, oops, let me scoot over here. So the cells are often modeled as a fiber-reinforced composite uh, that has four layers to it. And in each layer, there's different volume fraction of the fibers and different orientation of the fibers. cell wall has this fiber reinforced structure. There's the cellulose fibers in a matrix of lignin and hemicellulose. And there's four layers, each with the fibers in a different orientation. And 
and there's the middle lamella between the two cells. So in doing the modeling of, of a material like wood, you need to know what the properties of the cell wall material are, because obviously the properties of the wood would depend on the cell wall properties. And it turns out that they're similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar in different species of wood. So we're going to call them more or less the same. So the density of the solid is 1,500 kilograms per cubic meter. The modulus of the solid in the axial direction is 35 gigapascals. The modulus in the tangential direction or transverse direction is 10 gigapascals. And the strength of the solid in the axial direction is 350 megapascals. And the strength in the transverse direction is about 135. So here A means axial direction, and T is transverse. And just for comparison, if you just look at cellulose, cellulose has some pretty amazing properties. The modulus of cellulose is about 140 gigapascals, which is very high for a polymer. And the strength of cellulose fibers run between about 700 and 900 um, megapascals. So the cellulose fibers have very impressive properties, and that's one of the things that gives wood very good properties. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So the next thing is I want to show you some stress strain curves for wood, and you'll see how similar they are to the honeycombs that we looked at before. Um, and then we'll look at how the cells are deforming as they're getting loaded, and from that we're going to do some modeling. Okay. So let me just wait until people have caught up. Are we caught up? More or less? Okay. Okay, so these are all compression curves, so I'm just going to talk about compression. So these are curves for different types of woods. And on the left, the wood is loaded in, in the tangential direction. So in terms of you know, this sort of honeycomb model, it, it's loading it kind of this, this way on, like that. And on the right are a set of curves for wood loaded in axial compression. So in axial compression, we're loading it that way on. Okay. And we've got different species here. So the lowest density is balsa, around about 100 kilograms per cubic meter. The densest species on this plot is beech, which is around 700 kilograms per cubic meter. And then there's pine and willow, some other species in between here. So you can see the shapes of the curve look just like the um, curves that we had for the honeycombs. So here there's a linear elastic bit, there's a stress plateau, and there's a densification bit. So the, and then as the density goes up, the, it gets stiffer, and the strain at which the densification occurs uh, gets smaller and the strength gets higher. Uh, and if we look at the axial properties, the shape of the curve is similar. We get linear elastic, stress plateau, densification. Uh, but if you look at the scale here, this scale goes from 0 to 100, whereas that scale went from 0 to 20. And so the, the stiffness and the strength along the grain are much higher than they are across the grain. And you probably already know that. that wood is stronger and stiffer along the grain than across the grain. Okay. So that's what the stress strain curves look like. And the fact that we're getting the curves that look like that makes us think maybe the mechanisms of deformation and failure are similar to the honeycomb too. So here's a, here's a set of curves for balsa all plotted on the same scale. And again, you can see the, the 
for loading across the grain, either in the radial or the tangential direction, the stiffness and the strength is a lot less than if you load it in the axial direction. So a number of years ago, we had a project on balsa. And the thing we were interested in doing was looking at how the cells deformed and failed. And because balsa is a low density wood, it was easier to see the deformation in, in the cells because the cell walls were thin. So that's why we chose balsa. I actually have a project on balsa right now. And um, Sardar, my postdoc, is doing more detailed kind of finite element modeling, trying to represent the structure of balsa. And I think I mentioned the reason we're interested in it is that balsa is used as a core in sandwich panels in wind turbine blades. And, uh, it's, it's actually the best material that they can find. It's better than any engineering material. So that's uh, comparing the three curves for balsa. And then if you look um, at a specimen that's loaded in the SEM, you can, uh, with a loading stage, you can measure the stress-strain curve and you can take photographs of what the cellular structure looks like at different stages of loading. So here, this picture one is unloaded. And these four images here are looking at the same section of cells, the same area of cells. And you can see there's a big vessel here, and that's the same vessel there. So here, this image two is at this point on the stress-strain curve. Here's three at that point, and four is at that point. So if you look at this carefully, and I've got another higher mag picture I'll show you in a second, um, you can see that what's happening is the cell walls are bending. So it's kind of like taking my honeycomb like this, and I'm doing that to it, and the cell walls are bending. So just the same as the honeycomb. And then eventually, if I load it enough, you get to this sort of densified stage, and you're doing this, and the stress-strain curve increases sharply. So here you can see how the cells have densified over here. It kind of looks a lot like my honeycomb when I, oops, maybe I do it this way, when I smush it up like that. It looks kind of similar. So if we look at the higher mag picture, again, these four images are the same area of the cells. And you can, if you look at that little bit of crud, it's the same on all four of them there. So this is the unloaded one. And these were loaded from top to bottom. And this is loaded uh, to some extent. That's loaded more, and that's loaded more. So if you look at this cell here, it's got this little tear on it, so you can sort of find it again. If you look at that cell there, that's what it looks like unloaded. And here you can see, see that wall there? You can see how it's bent up. So it's bent like the honeycomb walls. And here that's bent even more. And eventually it sort of has this sort of a shape here. And you know, it's formed a, it's, it's deformed permanently. It's formed one of these plastic hinges. So it's like the aluminum honeycombs almost that it's failed like that. So in the balsa wood, when we load it uh, in the tangential direction, we're getting bending of the cell walls and then yielding and plastic hinges forming, just the same as we would in an aluminum honeycomb. OK, are we good with that? Well, I'll go through the all three directions, and then I'll write down the notes. Um, so this is loading the balsa in the radial direction. And these things here are the rays. OK, so we're loading it in that direction. And here you see uh, this also bending occurs. But the rays act a little bit like fiber reinforcement. So the rays are a little bit stiffer, and they sort of reinforce the thing a bit. And this is the loading platen here. And you can kind of see that the Failure starts at the loading platen, and as you sort of load it more, it progresses in from the loading platen. So we're going to look at the modeling of the balsa in the radial direction, and we're going to count for the rays, at least in a crude way. And then when you load the balsa in the axial direction, um, initially you don't really see much happening. So if one is unloaded, one's down here, and two is at this peak stress up here. And really, if you look between one and two, you just don't see an awful lot of difference. And that's because what you're doing is you're taking the wood and you're loading it this way on, and it's so stiff you just don't see much deformation. So there's not really much to see. But then eventually, you start, something starts to fail. And in this case, what fails are the end caps. So the balsa wood you know, has these long cells here, but then at the end of the cells, there's little caps on the ends. And the cells kind of fit together like that, so that eventually, if you keep smushing it, those end caps start to fail. And you can see here, oops, wrong button. Here you can see how bright it gets, and the cells are starting to crush together and kind of fail those end caps. And in fact, each one of these serrations here, if you look at, say, from that peak up to that peak, that corresponds to a length of about the length of the cell, or the length of the uh, cell between the end caps. So, so in axial deformation, you're, you're just actually deforming the cells until you break those end caps. If you look at denser woods, they fail in slightly different ways. This is a Douglas fir, which is much denser. Uh, this, this particular specimen, the whole thing is kind of buckled over, so it's not really so representative of the, this, the structure itself. 
Uh, this is Douglas fir in radial compression. You can see this picture looks just like what I showed you for the balsa wood, that sort of propagation of the failure. And uh, these are the, oops, these long things here are the rays. Uh, and this is a Norway spruce in axial compression. And this is fairly common in, in denser woods. You get this um, buckling formation. And what happens is, I think you get some yielding of the cell walls initially, uh, but that leads to um, buckling, like a plastic buckling. And you can see on this higher mag picture down here, you get these really small wavelength um, buckles in the cell wall. And the two, you, know, you get a plane that kind of shears over itself. And you can see in the top image that the, you know, this top half has sheared over relative to the bottom half. And all the deformation is in this little band here. So this, you know, this stuff here is all going on in that band up, up there. Okay, so let me write down some notes about um, how these things deform and fail. Uh, and then we'll get to the modeling in a little bit. Okay, so we can say the stress strain curves resemble those for honeycombs. And I'll say the mechanisms of deformation and failure are most easily identified in low-density balsa wood. So for balsa, if we look at the tangential loading, we see bending of the cell walls and then eventually plastic yielding. radial loading, the rays act as reinforcing. And for axial loading, you get axial deformation and then failure of the end caps. And I'll just say failure by plastic buckling is also observed say, in the denser woods. Okay. Oops. Okay, oops, where's my clicker? Here we 
sure it was Annie, right? Okay. All right, so then we can look at some data for the properties of, of woods. And these charts plot relative Young's modulus and relative strength against relative density. So here the modulus of the wood is divided by the modulus of the solid cell wall material. And here we've, we've normalized everything by the modulus of the solid cell wall material in the axial direction, because the cell wall itself is anisotropic. Um, and so here's the relative modulus, and here's the relative density. These are log-log plots. And we see that when we load the wood in the axial direction, the moduli is just linearly related to the density. And we when we load it across the grain, it varies with the cube of the relative density. So do you remember our little honeycomb models? If I took the honeycomb and I loaded it this way, it went as the cube of T over L. And that's because of the bending. And so the wood doesn't lie perfectly on that cube line, but it's, it's fairly close. And then similarly, if we took the honeycomb and we loaded it this way on and it deformed axially, the modulus depended linearly on the um, density. So you get the same kind of relationships there. And then if you look at the strength, the strength along the grain goes linearly, uh, and the strength across the grain goes with the square. And uh, we'll see when we get to the modeling in a minute that if we loaded, say, an aluminum honeycomb this way on, the strength would go linearly with the density if we we're just yielding the cell walls. And if we loaded it this way on, it went as the square of T over L. So it, these things kind of correspond. And you can see the structure of the wood is a lot more complicated than just a simple honeycomb. And so these models are sort of first order, and they're fairly crude. They don't try to capture every detail of the wood structure. Uh, but they can give you a, a sense of where the wood properties are coming from. So let me just write down some of these observations. <clears throat> so the data for the wood, the modulus along the grain goes linearly with density. goes more or less as the cube for loading in the tangential direction. And the radial direction is somewhat stiffer than that. The strength in the axial direction goes linearly with the density. And the strength. across the grain goes with the square of the density. And then there's data for the Poisson's ratios, too. So let me just write them down. So the modeling based on the honeycomb is sort of a simplified model that gives you kind of a first order description of the behavior. And it doesn't really attempt to capture all the details of the uh, softwood and hardwood structure.
And in the equations, I'm going to take the cell wall properties along the grain, or along the axial direction. And we're going to have a bunch of constants that describe the cell geometry. And those constants are also going to reflect the cell wall anisotropy. Anis anisotropy. So we can model the wood structure as something that's a bit more of a simplified thing, just like this. And we say we've got cells that are roughly hexagonal, and then we've got some cells that are more or less rectangular that are the ray cells. And if you look at lots of micrographs, you can get some idea what the dimensions of the cells are. And these dimensions were measured for um, a particular density of balsa wood. <coughs> So if we look at the linear elastic moduli, we can start off with a tangential loading. And if we have the tangential loading, we can model it as a honeycomb loaded in the plane, and we get cell wall bending. And from the cell wall bending and the honeycomb model, you would get that the tangential modulus varies with the relative density cubed. And the, the structure is not quite that simple. There's ray cells, there's end caps, and they act to stiffen it a little bit. And the data lie a little bit above this line. Then if we look at the radial loading, the, the rays kind of line up with the radial direction. And the rays act as reinforcing plates. And so you can just use kind of an upper bound composites idea to get the modulus. And the rays tend to be a bit denser than the fibers. So if I say VR is the volume fraction of rays, and R is the ratio of the relative density of the rays compared to the fibers, so it's rho over rho s for the rays divided by rho over rho s for the fibers. And that 
varies a little bit from one species to another or one specimen to another, but it's something a little over one, something between one and two. Then I can say the modulus in the radial direction is the volume fraction of the rays times r cubed times the tangential modulus plus one minus the volume fraction of rays times the tangential modulus. And that works out to be about 1.5 times the tangential modulus. I wanted to work this out in terms of the tangential modulus, so I've put this in terms of the tangential modulus in the first term there. So we get that the radial modulus is slightly larger than the tangential, but also goes roughly as the cube of the density. And then for the axial loading, we just have axial deformation in the cell wall, and the, young, and the Young's modulus just varies, varies linearly with the density. So th these are kind of simple models, but they kind of explain to first order the density dependence of the wood moduli and the anisotropy. So it's kind of nice because they're fairly simple models and it gives you kind of a big picture. So if you wanted to know the modulus of a particular piece of wood, this probably isn't the best way to figure it out. But if you wanted to kind of compare how do woods behave in general and how does the density affect the properties and why are they anisotropic, this is a pretty good way to do it. We could also look at the Poisson's ratios, and just because I didn't want to write them down again, I'm, I've just left on what the data were down here. But let me just write what the model would give us uh, for new RT and new TR. The model would give us one if we had regular hexagonal cells, uh, and these are the values we get here. This might be, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 would be a typical value somewhere in around 0.4 in there. So they're not quite one, but they're close to it. And I think uh, the reason they're a little less is because the rays and the end caps provide some constraint. And you don't, you know, if you have the honeycomb, if I just had these cells and I, I squeeze it like this, these guys can move out. And if it's a regular hexagonal honeycomb, the strain that I'm applying here is equal to the strain going out that way. But if I have rays this way that sort of constrain it or end caps, uh, it means that the Poisson's ratio is going to be a little bit less. So I'll just say constraining effect of the end caps and rays. Constraining. Then for new RA and new TA, the model says the value we would get would be zero. And these are pretty close to zero. They're not quite zero, but pretty close. And then the last pair, new AR, 
of nu a t, the model says that we would get nu of the solid. And the data is close to 0 0.4, which you might expect would be about the nu of the solid. So again, there's some variation in the Poisson's ratios. They're not all just one number. But you can see you know, these, these ones here are about 0, and that's roughly what the model says. These ones here are closer to 1, uh, and then these ones here are closer to what you might expect for a solid material. So it gives you the kind of general, general idea. Are we good? We good? Yeah. So we can do a similar thing for the compressive strength. Uh, so for tangential loading, we get plastic hinges forming in the vent cell walls. Just like in an aluminum honeycomb. we get that the strength over the cell wall strength goes into the relative density squared, so just like the honeycomb. For the radial loading, we can do the composites thing again. So we can say the strength in the radial direction is about equal to the volume fraction of rays times r squared times tangential strength plus 1 minus the volume fraction of rays times the tangential strength. And for balsa, we have some values here. Vr is about equal to 0.14. R is about equal to 2. And so the radial strength is about equal to 1.4 times the tangential. And in higher density woods, the value of R is a little bit smaller. And in general, the radial strength is a bit larger than the tangential. And both depend on the density squared. And then for axial loading, if the failure is initiated by yielding in the cell walls, then the axial strength is just going to depend linearly on the density. So the idea with these models isn't that they kind of describe a particular, um, you know, particular piece of wood exactly. It's more that it gives you a general picture of how the cells are deforming and failing, and how the properties scale with density and why the wood's anisotropic. Are we good? Yep, caught up. OK, so there's a couple more sort of interesting things we can do uh, with looking at the wood properties. So we've been talking about how to model the cellular structure, but people have also looked at how to model the cell wall as a fiber composite. And this plot and the next one kind of show you how you can, can combine all of that together. So remember I said the modulus of the cellulose was around 140 gigapascals. So here's the modulus of the cellulose. Um, at least the crystalline part of the cellulose plotted in that little envelope there. 
The lignin and the hemicellulose have a modulus around two or three gigapascals, so it's down there. And if you made composites with cellulose fibers in lignin and hemicellulose matrix, those composites would have a modulus that fell in this envelope here. They've got to be in between those two limits, right? The modulus have to be between those two limits. The density have to be within the densities of the constituents. And if you look at the modulus of the wood cell wall, it lies in this envelope here. The, along the grain would be here, and then across the grain is further down here. So the cell wall modulus is in here. And then if you take that cell wall and you make it into the honeycomb type material that wood is, if you load it along the grain, you're going to get this linear dependence of uh, modulus on density. And if you load it across the grain in the radial or the tangential direction, you're going to get this cube dependence here. So here's a, a set of data for different woods of different densities, and that envelope kind of um, encompasses all of them. Uh, but if you, if you look at the slope of that data, it's roughly equal to a slope of 1, and so it corresponds to that uh, equation there. And similarly, here's a, a set of data for different species of woods of different densities loaded perpendicular to the grain, and they lie on a line that has more or less a slope of 3, and this set of data here along the grain intersects the wood cell wall sort of towards the top of that envelope, and this set of data here intersects closer to the bottom of that set of that envelope for the cell wall material. So this gives you a way of sort of putting everything together on one plot, the cell wall as well as the cellular structure. So that plot does it for the modulus, and you can do the same kind of thing for the strength. Here's the cellulose up here, here's the lignin down there, here's the wood cell wall, the composite made from those two, and then here's data for different kinds of woods loaded along the grain and for loaded across the grain. So it gives you a way of kind of putting all of this modeling into one set of plots. Uh, so let me just write a couple of little things about that. We could say you could model the cell wall as a fiber composite. <coughs> and you can use the composite upper and lower bounds to give an envelope. And then you can also show the cellular solids models on the same plot. So overall, it shows you how the hierarchical structure fits together uh, and can be modeled. more cute things we can see. So another thing I wanted to talk about is material selection, because it turns out wood is very good compared to other materials in certain applications. So we're going to look at, say, having a beam of a given stiffness and a given span, and say it's just a rectangular or a square cross-section beam of edge length t. And the question is, what material would minimize the mass of the beam? So say we have you know, some span we have to have. It's got to have some rectangular cross-section, um, some given stiffness. 
And the question is, what's the material that minimizes the mass? So there's a little short calculation we can do to figure that out. And then I've got another plot, and you can compare different materials on this other plot, and you'll see how, how good wood is compared to other materials. So for a beam of a given stiffness, a given span, and say it's a square cross-section And the question is, what material minimizes the mass of the beam? You guys okay? Yeah. So the mass is just going to be the density times t squared times L. And if it's a beam, Say it's got some central load on it, a concentrated load. The deflection is going to go as PL cubed <coughs> divided by some constant and divided by the Young's modulus and the moment of inertia, I. So the stiffness, if I just rearrange this, the stiffness P over delta, that's going to go as uh, P over delta, CEI, and I is going to go as T to the fourth over L cubed, and then I can solve that for T squared, and I, I want T squared because I'm going to plug it back into the equation for the mass. So if I solve this for T squared, I've got my stiffness, P over delta. I've got L cubed divided by C E, and then I take that whole thing to the 1 half power like that. And then I plug the T squared back into the little equation for the mass. So I've got density times P over delta times L cubed over C E. And we take that whole thing to the one half power. Oop, and then I have another L. And so to minimize the mass, you want to look at the material properties. And here are the material properties of the density and the Young's modulus. And to, to minimize the mass, you want to minimize rho over E to the one half power. Or conversely, you want to maximize e to the 1 half over rho. Okay, so if you just had, if you had a bar that you were just pulling on, you would just want to maximize e over rho. But if it's a beam in bending, it works out that you want to maximize e to the 1 half over rho. And if we look at the next slide, this next slide then plots on a log-log scale, it plots the modulus on this axis and the density on that axis. And here, this plotted uh, data for lots of different materials. So there's engineering alloys, metals, are up here. Engineering ceramics are here. Composites are here. Uh, polymers are down here. Elastomer is way down here. Foamy things down here. And this envelope here is woods. And Notice the log scale here. The, the lowest stiffness polymer foams here are 0.01 gigapascal, and diamond is up here at 1,000 gigapascal. So there's like five orders of magnitude difference in the modulus here. So then if you look at the bottom right corner here, there's a bunch of dashed lines. And this red one here is e to the 1 half over rho. So if it's a log log plot, e to the 1 half over rho is going to show up as a straight line. And every point on that line has the same value of e to the 1 half over rho. And the material that would be the best um, for uh, a beam of a given stiffness would be the one that has the biggest value of e to the 1 half over rho. And if I move the line up to the top left here, I'm increasing e, I'm decreasing rho. It's got the biggest value of e to the 1 half over rho. So the materials that are on this line here they all have the same value of e to the 1 half over rho, and they've got the biggest value, well, virtually the biggest value. Uh, so let's look at what those materials are. There's, there's things like engineering ceramics like diamond that maybe are not the most convenient thing to make our beam out of and tend to be brittle and might break, so they have some issues. There's engineering composites, so things like uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastics. 
And at this sort of tip of the composites, there'd be things like uni uni unidirectional um, fiber composites. And then here's the woods down here. So the woods have the uh, same performance index, this is called the same value of e to the 1 half over rho, as the best engineering composites. And so they have very good properties for their weight. And one of the interesting things is, if you look at this performance index of e to the 1 half over rho, this is the performance index for the wood. This is for the solid cell wall material that the wood's made from, so e to the 1 half uh, of the solid over rho of the solid. And from the modeling of the wood, just looking at the axial modulus, this thing here is equal to that times rho s over rho. So if you look at this, this is the performance index for the wood. This is the solid it's made from. This number here is bigger than 1, right? Because the density of the solid is bigger than the density of the wood. And so this is saying the wood is more efficient than the thing that it's made from, than the solid that it's made from. And so that's the, the sort of plot for the stiffness. And there's a similar plot for the strength. That if you do the same little kind of calculation, you find that the performance index for the strength is some failure strength raised to the 2 thirds power over rho. And again, here we're plotting strength versus density on a log log plot. And this red line here is uh, the strength to the 2 thirds over rho. And again, if we scoot over here, so we have a parallel line, every point on that line has the same value of the strength um, to the 2 thirds power over the density. And these are the materials that have the highest values. And again, here's engineering composites. Uh, these are ceramics, but the ceramics, they have a high compressive strength, but they tend to be brittle, so it's not really a practical strength. Uh, these are metals in here, and here's the woods down here. So it's kind of interesting just to see that the wood has such a good property. Yes? Uh, so why, so I like, realized like, why this is valuable, setting, it this, setting up the problem this way, but um, if you're actually trying to design something, why would you want to fix your cross-section? Oh, but so... You could change your, change your material true. and change your cross-section. So this is, the, the this is the starter uh, version of this problem. And there's another... <laughs> part two of the problem is to change the shape, and you could look at what shape's efficient. There's something called a shape factor that gives you the efficient shapes. So you could take the material and turn it into a different shape and have a more efficient thing because it was a different shape. So there is a... You can't account for so that. Like even if we still square, you yeah. just still make it smaller. Oh uh, yeah, I'm saying we've got a given stiffness. So if we're given a certain stiffness and a certain span, we would need a certain cross section to get to that stiffness. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Are we happy? Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, one thing. Um, let's see here. So let me just write a few more notes about the material selection, and then there's one more thing I wanted to show you about the woods. C is just a constant, so it's just some number. So you know, if you had a beam in three-point bending, then C would be 3. If you had a beam that was simply supported with a central load, C would be 48. It's, C is just a number. No, it's not about cost. There's nothing on cost here. It, it's all really about the properties. What's the best combination of properties to minimize the mass, and then which, the, which material has that combination of properties? You can, you can do charts like this that include cost. Um, you can make these charts with whatever property you want. Uh, Between pine and balsa? Mm, yeah, maybe more than that. I think I can't quite see where pine's close to 100 and balsa's, I don't know, really like 20 or something. Really it's just a of yeah, and it's not, I mean, the point of this isn't so much looking at the absolute value of a strength, it's looking at the value of this performance index. And uh, what you want to do is maximize that index to get the material that's going to minimize the mass. Okay. okay, so let me just write a couple notes about this. So we have these, these are called material selection charts. So you plot the log of one property versus the log of some other property. And then we have a line of constant 
e to the one half over rho. I'll just say it's shown in red because you're going to have the same plots. And the materials with the largest values are on the upper left. So the woods have similar values to engineering composites. And you can do a similar thing for strengths. Okay. So I have a few more minutes. and I want to talk about a couple of uses of woods. Um, so one is in old ships. So I don't know if you know, Professor Lechman has this course, Materials in the Human Experience, and they talk about sort of ancient uses of materials. And I did a section, a module on, on woods and the use of woods in old colonial ships, like the Constitution that's in Boston Harbor. So this is kind of a schematic of a, an old uh, ship. And the th thing that was interesting and the thing that I talked about in this module was that people chose particular species for particular parts of the boat. And they would choose a particular species depending on its properties. And a lot of the hull was made of oak. So oak's a very dense wood. Uh, but they would get something they called straight oak, and they would get something they called compass oak. And you can see this little thing down here, this little kind of schematic here, this little sketch. Uh, this is straight oak, just a straight trunk. And this thing here would be the compass oak. And what they would do is they would use the straight oak for straight parts of the boat, so you know something like this, these pieces here. And then they would actually look for trees that had the curve of the branches to match some part of the boat that they were looking for. So for instance, um, if you have the hull out here and the deck here, and they had their cannons here, there's something called a knee, which is sort of a bracing piece that goes between the deck and the hull, and that bracing piece is curved. And they would actually look for trees in which the branches curved at the same kind of curvature as they were looking for in that piece, and then they would use it for that piece. And the advantage of this is they basically had the grain running along the curve, and so they got the best properties out of the wood by doing that. So they had this straight oak and compass oak, and that was one uh, cute thing. And often they used white oaks, and I brought a piece of white oak in. You can see how dense it is. And the US Navy uh, often used something called live oak. Live oak grows in the south. Anybody from the south? You see these big trees with huge sort of spreading branches. Those are the live oaks. And apparently the US Navy, I read somewhere, still has a forest somewhere with live oak for doing things like repairing the Constitution. So let me just pass those guys around. So those are a couple of the oaks they would use for the hull. Then they would use uh, white pine for the masts. And the reason they used white pine for the mast is the white pine grows very, very tall and very straight. And white pine was actually like a strategic resource in the 1600s and 1700s. So, and it turns out that when the British Royal Navy was um, you know, doing all that colonial stuff in the 1600s, Britain actually ran out of trees for masts for boats. And they would actually import masts from New England. And there were these people called surveyors who would go around and they would mark certain trees that were supposed to be saved for these masts for the British Royal Navy. And the, the thing was that the, the size of the boat and how many cannons you could put on the boat depended on how, how big the mast was. So the size of the boat depended on this, the mast because the mast, it, the mast height depended on, uh, it controlled how much sail area you could, you could get. So the taller the mast, the more sail, the more sail, the bigger the ship, the bigger the ship, the more cannons. And so having these tall uh, eastern white pines was a sort of a strategic resource. And I have a piece of white pine. Unfortunately, my dog got to this one. So there's, so there's some, and be careful, it's a bit splintery, but you can see it's a lighter kind of wood. And if you go around New England, uh, if you go to the Arboretum, you can see white oak and you can see eastern white pine. The other th wood they used is lignum vitae, that first dense one that I passed around. And if you notice that lignum vitae, it has kind of a waxy feel to it. And they used that in the block and tackle. So like pulleys and stuff like that. 
and it was thought to be self-lubricating because of that kind of waxy layer on it. And because it's very dense, if you think of like a block and tackle and you've got like a rope going over a pulley, you've got a pressure from, you know, everything sort of fitting together and the bits bearing against each other and the fact that it was very dense made it very good for the block and tackle. And so they used the lignum vitae for that. And there's one other cute story about lignum vitae. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever read Davis Sobel's book called Longitude. Anybody read that? I'm a sucker for those history of science books. So her book, Longitude, is about the development of an instrument to measure longitude. If they used to be able to navigate, originally they could get the latitude from the stars, but they were really bad at getting the longitude. And so boats would go off and they wouldn't really be able to figure out where they were until they had a method to measure longitude. And there was some British, I don't know, board of something or another, they, they put forward a prize for somebody who could produce a way of measuring longitude accurately. And there was a guy called John Harrison, and he built a clock. He built a very accurate chronometer. And if you knew you know, when sunrise was and sunset was, and you knew the time where you left, you could figure out where you, it's kind of like time zones, you could figure out where you are today. And he built a chronometer, and <coughs> one version of his chronometer used the lignum vitae for the same reason, because it was very dense and it was very stable. Um, and the clock that he eventually the, won the prize with was in the 1700s, 1759. I think he, they went on some trip with it. It was 81 days at sea, and it lost five seconds over 81 days. So that's pretty impressive for, you know, 250 years ago. So that was the lignum vitae in the clock. And I have one more picture, and then I can finish up the thing on wood, and we'll start the cork next time. So this is a, another example of using wood, and this is sort of a more modern use. So this bridge here is made with a glue laminated wood. So this big beam here, big arch, is uh, made up of sections of wood which are uh, glued together, and you can glue the sections in a curved shape if you want, and sort of have molds to do that. And when they make this glue laminated wood, they cut the defects out. So they cut knots out, and they, you know, they control the, the pieces of each laminate that they use uh, to get the best quality. And the glue laminated wood actually has better properties than just you know, two by fours or whatever you would cut down, you know, uh, lumber that you would cut from a tree. So glue laminated wood is kind of a nice uh, kind of uh, wood structure that's used now. And you see it all the time in things like um, ice rink arenas, like large span. It's, and it's kind of beautiful. You can see the wood grain and the curve in the wood grain when they make these things. So that's the wood lecture. I'm going to stop there. So next time I'll talk about cork. I just have a little bit about cork. And then uh, we'll start talking about phones. Okay?